American tactics and technology in the 1980s and 90s were shaped by the lessons learned during the Vietnam War. The previous generation of fighter pilots had not been trained in air combat maneuvering. And they were forced to fly aircraft that were not specifically designed to dogfight. All of that had changed by 1990. By 1990, with the Gulf War, the Air Force and the Navy had advanced on two fronts. One is they had advanced new fighters like the F-15 air superiority fighter and the F-14 interceptor fighter. In addition, they had much better weapons. The Sparrow had improved, the Sidewinder had improved, and the pilot training had considerably improved. When Saddam Hussein seized Kuwait on August 2nd, 1990, and the drums of war began to beat, American air power faced its greatest threat in decades. The Iraqis had MiG-29 interceptors, they had MiG-23s, they had French F-1s, and pilots and ground commanders had experience fighting with the Iranians. Thus, the U.S. really organized in a way to create an overkill situation where we had to use all of our assets against a prepared adversary. Electronic warfare aircraft could block enemy radars and clear corridors of attack for bombers, whose precision-guided munitions could take out command control centers and anti-aircraft defenses. AWACS could monitor the situation, calling out any airborne enemy aircraft to American fighters who could take them on. Tankers could feed the beast, keeping the entire war machine flying for hours on end. Such combined force was championed by Air Force fighter pilot and strategist Colonel John Boyd, who created a concept explaining how Allied energy should be used to defeat the enemy and survive, collectively known as the OODA loop. The OODA loop stands for observation, orientation, decision, and action. What it really means is that you outthink and outact the adversary by knowing more, by destroying his capability to think at the same level that you are. What does this mean for warfare? What it means is if you can go out on the first night of the Gulf War and you can destroy by actively bombing or jamming the Iraqi radars, and then you can actually bomb and destroy their command and control centers, and you can scare the hell out of the commanders that do survive by blowing up his center and by disrupting it, that is what the OODA loop means. You have scared the enemy or you have destroyed his radars and you've destroyed his capability to react. The extraordinary use of Allied air power on January 17th works exactly as planned. Air Force and Navy planes have disrupted the Iraqis' ability to gather information and make decisions. Eight of their best fighter aircraft have been destroyed. Radar stations, command and control centers, and surface-to-air missile sites have been reduced to rubble. But as the war goes on, the Iraqi defense stiffens. More fighters rise to challenge the Americans. January 19, 1991. Four F-15C Eagles soar high above a cloud deck that obscures the desert sands of western Iraq. Captains Rick Tolini and Larry Pitts are number one and two in the four-ship flight, providing escort to a massive coalition strike package. Well, as it turned out, just as we were, were finishing up our refueling, the AWACS called out, uh, at that time, bogeys uh, approximately 60 to 80 miles north of us. The four Eagles break off to engage the threat. Within seconds, they have multiple radar contacts. I saw two groups of airplanes, one straight in front of us, which had been called out as MiG-25s at about 10,000 feet heading straight south, and another group about 30 degrees right of us at about 50 miles, which had been called out as MiG-29s, and they were also heading at us. So they were heading south, southwest. The MiG-29s are closer and present the greatest threat. Pitts targets the 29s until the bandits surprise him. 
they turned around and started heading back towards Baghdad. So they turned cold, which meant they were no longer a threat to us at that point. So my radar work went back to the group of MiG-25s who were right in front of us. The MiG-25 Foxbat is a very high-speed interceptor, capable of Mach 2.83. It was designed to catch up to even the fastest American aircraft and take them down with radar-guided or infrared missiles. The F-15C Eagle is the premier air superiority fighter in the U.S. Air Force arsenal. A mixture of unprecedented maneuverability and acceleration, range, weapons, and avionics. The MiG has the edge in raw speed, but the Eagle's weapons, radar, and agility far outclass the Fox Bat. At 25 miles, the Americans use their radar to lock the MiG-25s up. But these Iraqi pilots are skilled and aggressive. The MiG-25s actually executed a Soviet-based uh, anti-Eagle radar tactic. The MiG pilot spits out chaff to cloak his maneuvering as he dives low to blend in with ground reflections. They turned directly to the west and went down very low and actually broke our radar locks, and we lost them for a little while. But abruptly, one of the MiG-25s turns back into the Americans. The MiG-25 turns back in, which is the tactic. Hopefully, he'll see us before we see him. And just then, the second MiG-25 gets Pitts's attention. Pitts is here on the far right side of the American flight. The MiG-25 is here passing across his nose at supersonic speed along the desert floor. Pitts locks the bandit up and waits for the OK from flight lead Rick Tolini before he presses the attack. He could say press, cleared, or negative. What he said was press, which means now he's going to support me and I, I can consider myself the flight lead and not to worry about him. I roll inverted and do a split S maneuver from 10,000 feet. Pitts's maneuver will position him at the same level and behind his enemy, the perfect position for a missile shot. But it's a risky move. Pitts pulls an astonishing 12 Gs. The force takes man and machine to the absolute limits of survival. Well, obviously the integrity of the airplane is a big concern, but I'll tell you, the Eagle's very strong. And trust me, there was enough adrenaline flow in there that it didn't even phase me. For the first time, the American pilot spots his prey. As I pull down, that's when I get the tally-ho on the MiG-25. And there's still that low cloud deck down there, so I can see him on top of that cloud deck. If the MiG-25 pilot lights the afterburners and accelerates straight ahead, he could outrun Pitts. But the Iraqi decides to enter a turning fight with his much more agile opponent. He's a MiG-25 doing 700 knots. His turn radius is the size of Texas. I'm in an F-15 at fighting airspeed in the mid-400s. My turn radius is about 3,200 feet. So I'm very quickly inside of his turn. Before he completes the 180 degrees of turn, I'm in weapons parameters. The desperate Iraqi leans hard on the stick. He's turning very hard to try to defeat me, which means he's bleeding off quite a bit of airspeed. Pitts closes to within 9,000 feet, carefully selecting his weapon. Because of the big burner plume coming out of the airplane, I chose to select a heat-seeking missile, an AIM-9 Sidewinder. Um, when I selected that missile, I got a good tone from it. I uncaged it to make sure the seeker is tracking his uh, burner plume. But the Iraqi pilot is well-versed in countermeasures. The missile uh, tracks true to the target, and the uh, MiG-25 puts out flares and decoys the missile. I had a backup. I selected AIM-7 because it's radar-guided. I see it in the heads-up display as as a big circle. It's telling me to shoot, 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 which means it's in weapons parameter. So I launched this missile. The Sparrow guides to the target, but fails to explode. So Pitts goes to a second heat seeker. The Iraqi decoys the missile with another batch of flares. Captain Pitts, 
may have met his match. This guy is fighting hard. And I, I'm thinking to myself, if, this, if the missiles aren't going to work, I'm going to have to go gun this guy, um, which is not an easy solution when he's at 300 feet doing 500 knots and not in a turn. Pitts unleashes his last AIM-7. This one has got to work. And I fire the missile um, from 6,000 feet behind him, and it looks to me like it goes right up his tailpipes and blows up the back end of his airplane. Dodging debris, Pitts catches sight of flight leader Rick Tolini high to his left. And about five miles off Tolini's nose, Pitts spots a glint. And I'm thinking it's probably the other MiG-25. The bandit is nose to nose with Tolini and closing fast. But Tolini doesn't want to take a shot. At this angle, the bogey looks like an F-15. So Rick decided he needed to identify this airplane, and he did it in an extremely unique way. He calls out on the radio with the assumption that if it's a bad guy, he's not on our frequency. Is anybody an afterburner? And because we see a big afterburner plume coming out of this airplane. Tolini's gamble pays off. There's no F-15 in afterburner, so that plume means he's facing a MiG. Tolini fires an AIM-9. I see the missile come off. I also see flares come out of this airplane, and the heat-seeking missiles once again decoyed by flares. These two MiG-25 pilots were fighting very hard. But the Iraqi pilot makes a fatal mistake. Now the airplane turns what we call belly up to us, so we're seeing the underside of its belly, which is not a great place for the MiG to be. Rick selects an AIM-7 Sparrow radar-guided missile and fires it. That airplane just turns into a ball of dust. The Iraqis have lost two MiGs, but the coalition has stirred a hornet's nest. Less than 100 miles away, another pair of F-15 pilots are about to square off against the most advanced fighters in the Iraqi arsenal. January 19, 1991. Four F-15C Eagles streak through Iraqi airspace. Captain Cesar Rodriguez leads the flight. He's known as Rico, and his number two is Captain Craig Underhill. Call sign, Mole. Our initial mission was we were defensive counter-air, and our job was to protect the high-value assets, tankers, AWACS, rivet joint, uh, everybody who was uh, in support of the offensive counter-air missions, which were, were moving forward. But five hours into their flight, command calls to inform them their mission has changed. An Allied strike package has hit its target, and needs fighter protection for the push back home. They had asked us to help with their egress so that while they're pressing south, we can make sure there's nothing chasing them out. Rodriguez splits his flight. He and Underhill will cover the bombers, leaving numbers three and four to protect the high value assets. On the way to the target, the Eagles pick up some activity on their search radars a pair of planes to the northeast, about 60 miles away. With the help of AWACS and other assets that are in the area, and, and through a collective means, we were able to determine that these are two MiG-29s. The Soviet-built MiG-29 Fulcrum is a Mach 2-capable air superiority fighter, the most advanced fighter aircraft in the Iraqi arsenal. The Eagle has a better radar and weapons platform, giving it the edge in long-range detection and destruction of enemy targets. But the MiG's better thrust-to-weight ratio gives it the advantage in maneuverability and rate of climb. 
Eagle pilots were advised not to get into close quarters turning fights with fulcrums if they could avoid it, especially since Iraqi MiG-29 drivers were known to be combat-hardened veterans. They took their best pilots out of their F-1s and stuck them in the MiG-29 when they got those from Russia. So we knew their, their pilots were combat qualified. We weren't, never been there. So that's an unknown for us. Rodriguez and Underhill lock the MiG-29s up at 40 miles. The Iraqis break off and head east, trying to lure the F-15s within range of SAM sites near Baghdad. But AWACS quickly reports a new pop-up contact, bogeys, 3.30 for 13. Possible enemy fighters are at the Americans' 9 o'clock, barely 13 miles away and closing at the speed of heat. I feel at that point that that group is the one that represents the biggest threat to, to the strike package. The Americans turn toward the west to head off the threat. The turn puts Rico about a mile and a half in front of Underhill and about 1,000 feet below him. Underhill quickly gets a radar lock on one of the unidentified planes, trying to ID the bogey before the merge. There's a lot of things you're doing with this hand and dialing gauges over here to make sure you're not going to shoot a friendly down. We're all trying to do the first thing, which is identify friendlies to prevent a fratricide, and also equally as important as identify the hostiles. With the opposing planes closing at mock speed, there's only seconds remaining before the merge. At eight miles away, AWACS finally calls the bandits out as hostiles. By the time hostile is out of his mouth, I'm pushing down and shooting an AIM-7. It was just like a freight train coming away. It comes under my nose, starts pulling lead on the first airplane coming in. At the same time, one of the bandits locks Rico up, throwing Rodriguez onto the defensive. My defensive mindset is first to take my aircraft and get down below his, his plane of motion. So I want to get below 8,000 feet uh, so that his radar is now looking at me or through me and includes the, the ground clutter. Rodriguez cranks his eagle to the left and dives, pumping out Chad. By the time he starts turning, I'm watching my missile go, and it is, here's Rico turning in front of me, here comes missile, plus or minus two, 300 feet right over the top of Rico's jet. So that was eye-opening for me, I'm, as I imagine it was for him and I hear him call Fox. I turn left in my cockpit, and I actually pick up the engine, the motor of his, of his AIM-7. Rodriguez sees the smoke trail and follows it to the MiG-29, now three and a half miles off his right wing. I'm really kind of right now at the mercy of what that missile is going to do. Uh, and sure enough, uh, I, the minute I picked up the silhouette, it couldn't have been more than two or three seconds later, and it's kaboom. and he goes splash one, and I turn my head back around and look, and sure enough, big brown cloud there. Rodriguez climbs to form up with Underhill. We're building our mutual support again. And to be honest with you, my first thought process is let's get the hell out of here. The pilots are about to egress to the south and hit the fuel tanker when a new warning interrupts them. AWACS comes back again and tells us that there's another second contact 10 miles to the north. And again, I, I make the assessment here that we can't turn around and put this guy inside of a weapons engagement zone at our six o'clock. So back into the fight. Circling back toward the engagement zone, the Americans quickly pick the bogey up with radar. Underhill is here at 8,000 feet, about half a mile in front of Rodriguez. The bogey is here, five miles away at 10,000 feet. 
Underhill uses his radar's auto acquisition mode to lock the bogey up. I lock him up in auto guns. He does a convenient turn for me and breaks back left in a pretty hard G turn. The bogey's left turn exposes the aircraft's plan view to Underhill, a large target for a radar guided AIM 7 Sparrow. I lock him up, I turn. I put my nose on him, I go to shoot an AIM-7. Lights up as a uh, diamond on my scope. It goes from a solid radar contact to a diamond, which tells me he's a friendly. Underhill's heart sinks. If this plane is a friendly, then his first kill may have been a squadron mate. January 19, 1991. After knocking down what he believed was an enemy aircraft, Captain Craig Underhill is facing the gut-wrenching possibility that he may have killed a squadron mate. I tell you, that is a, just a terrible feeling. Fratricide was something that the Eagle community took very seriously. Underhill and his flight lead, Rico Rodriguez, are now closing on a second unidentified bogey. Without confirmation the plane is hostile, he can't fire. I go from AIM-7 to AIM-9, back to guns, and as I'm going through about 4,000 feet on this guy, he rolls and pulls, it does about a 135 slice back into me. The mystery plane breaks hard into Underhill. Despite the aggressive maneuver, Underhill checks his fire. He and Rico are being forced into a classic merge with the unidentified aircraft. Underhill climbs, positioning himself 9,000 feet above Rico. Rico works to gain visual identification. Underhill keeps the bogey locked up on radar, poised for a missile shot if Rico confirms the target is hostile. So I will put my target detection box that's generated by the radar on the threat and see if I can VID this guy from, you know, beyond visual range. If I can get a VID before we hit the merge, that gives Mole an opportunity to take a shot and, uh, and then get this over with. Underhill's F-15 is still IDing the bogey as a friendly. 9,000 feet below him, Rico closes head on with the mystery plane, eyes outside the cockpit. I was committed to the merge and to get as close as possible so as to establish the, the ID. As the jets thunder past each other, Rico catches sight of the full silhouette. I could see the Iraqi colors of his tail fin, uh, the, 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 the flag, the MiG-29 silhouette, call that it's a MiG-29. I start a left-hand turn, he starts a left-hand turn. As each pilot struggles to turn inside his opponent, the fight descends. The MiG-29 pilot is at a slight advantage in this kind of fight. But with the ground rushing up at him, he may not be able to turn long enough to exploit his one strength. So Rico and him are now off to the races going downhill. As Rico slides in, the guy rolls and pulls again, and now they're probably heading uh, northwestish uh, in a 135 slice as Rico's trying to get in position to fire on this guy. It's a classic dogfight. Not what the F-15 was designed to do, but well within its capability. From 8,000 feet, the fight spirals towards the deck. As the fight migrates from the 8,000, 7,000, 6,000, below 5,000, and continues to drop down lower, um, the, 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 the desert floor starts to become a, a definite factor. Too close to use an AIM-7, Rodriguez fights to position himself for a heat-seeking sidewinder shot. The ground rushes toward the Iraqi pilot. He knows he must break in some direction. Abruptly, he rolls over and dives into a split S, daring the American to give chase. Rico doesn't bite. He skillfully coordinates the stick and rudder, pitching the F-15 vertical into a perch position to pounce on the Iraqi when he pulls out. 
and uh, before he actually hits perpendicular, he hit the desert floor, causing a fireball that just tumbles and tumbles and tumbles for, for what seems like an eternity to me. Splash Fulcrum 2. found ourselves in two what I would call less than traditional scenarios for what the F-15 was built to do in the sense of long range beyond visual range shooting. Regardless, the victories demonstrate that in almost any scenario, the F-15 is a superb fighter aircraft. As the air war marched on, F-15 Eagle crews continued their dominance in the skies of Iraq. With their protection, strike aircraft continued pounding command and control bunkers, radar installations, and anti-aircraft gun and missile sites. F-15 pilots accounted for 13 air-to-air -air victories in the first two days of the war. Nearly all achieved thanks to the Eagle's unmatched capability for beyond visual range, or BVR, combat the culmination of nearly a century of technological breakthroughs in aerial warfare. As a result of all the advancements in electronic warfare and systems and surveillance, the Gulf War was the first time where we saw two-thirds of the uh, air battle kills on the, on the part of the U.S. and Allied forces were done by beyond visual range AIM-7 missiles. In the early days of air combat, dogfighting was done close in with guns. As the missile age dawned, air combat became a more remote experience as the kill range skipped from yards to miles. Introduced during the Vietnam War, identification friend or foe equipment became a mandatory tool of modern air combat as dogfighting slipped beyond the range of human vision. Both the U.S. and the North Vietnamese aircraft had IFF systems, which were transponders that said, hello, I'm a friendly or I'm not a friendly. And that would help in figure out who's what we call red and blue. Because the worst thing you would want is for a blue friendly to shoot down a blue friendly, which actually did occur a couple of times in the Vietnam Air War. A transponder inside the plane is set with a code that transmits a certain frequency. If you're not squawking the same frequency, you're probably not a friend. When used in conjunction with E3 Sentry AWACS planes, IFF was highly effective, making BVR kills possible. With your setup, you would make sure that the AWACS understands where the friendlies are and where the bad guys are, and you would do a screen concept where you'd move forward and knock down any of the adversaries. January 26, 1991. Four F-15C Eagles soar over western Iraq. The flight lead is Captain Rory Drager, with his wingman, Captain Tony Schiavi. Element lead is Captain Cesar Rodriguez, with his wingman, Captain Bruce Till. West of Baghdad, at the northernmost portion of their cap rotation, AWACS picks up activity over H-2, a busy Iraqi airfield. The first call we get is there's four aircraft taking off from, from H-2 and, and sort of heading to the northeast. The Americans point their radars to the west in the direction of the airfield. We basically each do a sort of delayed 90-degree turn. So now that our four-ship wall is now running, you know, to the west-northwest. They form a wall of eagles, flying line abreast across a span of 10 miles. This allows the Americans to mass their firepower while giving them the most coverage with their radars. 
Everybody has their responsibilities. Some guys are looking low at the radar, some guys are looking high with the radar, so that we can make sure that we're covering anything that's flying from the surface of the ground to 50,000 feet. Sure enough, four long-range radar contacts. There are no known friendlies in the area. These guys are probably MiGs. The Americans throttle up full military power. The deafening roar of eight Pratt & Whitney turbofan engines echoes above the clouds. Though the enemy is far beyond visual range, the Eagles have spotted their prey. Drager wants to maintain the element of surprise. He issues a key order to his flight. Let's keep our radars in sweep. Let's make sure we have everything sort of figured out and know how many of them there are and what we need to do from a, from a targeting perspective. A premature radar lock is a surefire way to scare off the enemy before they're within missile range. Just like we have a radar warning receiver like a fuzz buster in a car, they have a, a, the same thing. And so if you lock on to a target, uh, that system is activated. One of the Iraqi jets bugs out with mechanical difficulties. The remaining three-ship flight stays low, less than 1,000 feet above the deck in a V formation. Combined force intel lets the Americans know what they're dealing with. By this time, we have multiple IDs from the variety of different sources that are involved, and, and all of them confirm MiG-23. The MiG-23 Flogger is a twin-engine fighter bomber. Envisioned as an all-weather interceptor, its sturdy design made it stable at extremely high speeds, especially at low altitude. The bandits are ID. And the Americans are cleared hot to shoot basically, you know, had met our rules of engagement in order to be able to, uh, you know, to take action. And, uh, and that's what we did. Drager assigns targets. He'll take the lead flogger. Schiavi will take the northernmost trailer. Rodriguez, the southernmost. The Americans lock the MiGs up on radar and push the button. AIM-7 Sparrows launch. Missiles are flying in every direction, making sure that we, you know, take these guys out. Three huge explosions light up the sky. The F-15s dive through the clouds, just in time to see their missiles strike home. It's a textbook BVR mission. Three bandits shot down from beyond visual range. particular engagement was, I think, very well done in the fact that not only did we get three kills, but as we start to egress out, everybody was checking each other's six, everybody was doing what they needed to do uh, to make sure that we carried this thing to its full conclusion and were safely across the border and, and back home again. In just over a month, Allied air power broke the back of the fifth largest air force in the world. In late February 1991, the air war is effectively over, having cleared the way for ground forces to retake Kuwait and chase Saddam Hussein's remaining forces back within their borders. Victory is declared in only three days. The coalition's triumph was an emphatic boost for current air war strategy. Multiple aircraft with specific roles working in concert to achieve victory. Air warfare in 1990, as it is today, really is a team sport. Multiple weapons, 
disrupted the Iraqi capability to deal with it. It was like a information overload. They just couldn't deal with the simultaneous strikes and the fact that their radars went offline, their command and control was shut down, jamming, deception. It was like having essentially a war nervous breakdown.